Hello, I am Tom Morello. I am the Night Watchman. This is the Night Watchman Speaks. You send in thoughtful questions and I do my best to answer them openly and honestly. Let's get right to it. Question number one today is, will you be at Comic-Con this year? Yes, I will. Uh, Comic-Con, I went to Comic-Con for the first time last year for the uh, debut of the, my Orchid comic series and that was quite a time, let me tell you that. Pleased to see that the geeks have inherited the earth as a proud, you know, Dungeons and Dragons uh, alumni and uh, Star Trek fan myself, but just that, you know, like every, you know, celebrity and director and actor, famous person comes down there to kiss the asses of uh, Nerd World. It's kind of awesome to see. Uh, but I will be there on Wednesday night, uh, on preview night, between 5 and 9 at the Dark Horse booth. There will be a Q&A, there will be a signing, um, and a panel. Those are the things that I'm going to be involved in. So, uh, because uh, it's it's actually promoting the 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 first uh, compilation, of the first four issues of the Orchid series are coming out in in paperback and going to be in Barnes and Nobles and places like that. So I'm going there to hype that up and meet some of you nice people. Next question, dear Tom Night Watchman, I like the idea behind your graphic novel Orchid, but when it while it positively sets itself apart from other comic books in many aspects, the main character's looks display stereotypical female comic book sexiness. Why is that? Regards. Uh, that is uh, well spotted, first of all. I mean, the, the, one, the one difficulty with a uh, episodic comic, like Orchid was written as a complete story, and my initial intention was that it would be a graphic novel that would come out at one time. Uh, it was at the, at the suggestion of Dark Horse to make it episodic, to sort of build... You know, sort of build a following behind it. So one of the challenges is to take us like, like well, the short answer is just hold on. <laughs> and that the uh, uh, I was very aware of the look of. I mean, first of all, she begins as a as a street prostitute, and then you know, uh, uh, use sexual violence is a big part of the issue. And there's no, certainly nothing that I want in the comic book to to promote that in any way. But it, the way that she begins as uh, sort of uh, a, a a piece of property of her pimp, then post goes to sort of own herself and her sexuality, and then later sort of transcends any of the stereotypes that have been imposed upon her um, by the way that sex exists in the world of Orchid uh, becomes clear when you see the whole story arc. So I would say hang in there with that. Um, next question. What are you reading right now, other than this question, of course? <laughs> Uh, uh, what am I reading right now? I'm actually currently reading simultaneously five different Bob Dylan biographies. Um, still trying to figure that guy out. I've always been a big fan of Bob Dylan's music, and the only biography I had read of his is his book, uh, Chronicles Volume 1, which is not, not really so much as a, is, it is as, while it's great, it is as enigmatic as any of his, uh, his songs. So you get sort of some flash insights into his life. I'm reading like five different, sort of cross-referencing five different Dylan biographies to try to get a better idea of who he is. Still have very little idea. Uh, and I'm in the midst of reading the Hunger Games books as well. I'm on the second one, and I greatly enjoy them. Next. Rage Against the Machine debut album will be 20 years old in November this year. Where has the time gone? I just wanted to ask, what was it like being an up-and-coming band and recording your first album? Uh, where do I start? It was, uh, you know, uh, Rage Against the Machine, for me, f you know, formed from the, uh, you know, I was in a band called Lock Up that every horrible record company cliche, bad thing that can happen to a band happened to Lock Up. Uh, we were dropped from our label and then, you know, you know, made a vow that I was never going to play another note of music that I didn't believe in and was fortunate to meet like-minded people and Zach, Tim, and Brad and we put together a band which had literally zero commercial ambition whatsoever. We just wanted to, we didn't we didn't dream of book really we didn't dream of like booking a gig. We just wanted to write songs that we that we liked. Uh, and so when we much to our surprise, the musical landscape changed like right under our feet. It went from being kind of like the hair metal '80s to being the Nirvana, Jane's Addiction, Primus, Soundgarden '90s, you know, like that. And uh, so a band that we thought was going to be just sort of confined to never doing anything other than rehearsing in a small rehearsal space out in the San Fernando Valley was now this kind of hot property, uh, was this coveted, you know, 
banned by all these major labels, which of course you know, we were very, very cynical about, you know, especially given you know, my, I was very cynical about given my background with, uh, with lockup. So we finally, you know, we, we, we signed to a record label. We, we've made, you know, Michael Goldstone was the person who signed us, was someone who was very simpatico and someone who was very much the fifth Beatle for a long time at the beginning of Rage. So we went to the studio to make a record, and we had this, like, the, you know, like, Rage Against, like, the, the, the inferno that is the Rage Against the Machine live show was there from the very, very beginning. Like, that's what it was like in the rehearsal room, you know? So we tried, the challenge was to find a way to get that onto record. So we, uh, you know, we were trying, we were recording the songs, and it sounded pretty sterile. It didn't really sound like, it didn't have the vibe or the excitement. So one night, we just invited all of our friends into the studio, or a bunch of friends in the studio. There were probably about, you know, 25, 30 people just sitting on the floor of the studio, and we just ran through the set a couple times, and most of the basic tracks for the first record were recorded that night because it sounded like Rage Against the Machine playing Rage Against the Machine songs for Rage Against the Machine fans, which is really what the band was built to do. Um, so it took a while to finish that first record, and part of it was because we were learning how to, to, we had to kind of get through the BS of how records used to be made, you know, and sort of like the, to, and to, make, to make the kind of record that was going to feel authentic. And we did that by playing live in the room in front of our fans. And if you listen to the end of, of a very fond memory of that, if you listen to the end of the song, Freedom, that is us literally destroying the gear in the studio at the end of the, at the, end of the session, um, which we would sometimes do at the end of our live shows. But you have to keep in mind, the only time when it's cool to destroy your gear is if you can't afford to replace it, which we couldn't. So we got that on tape. There you have it. One more question. Uh, between Audio Slave, The Night Watchman, and Street Sweeper Social Club, you have released at least one album per year since 2005, a pace very few musicians ever match. Is this an intentional effort on your part to expand your catalog and please your fans, or is it just where your muse is taking you? Well, you know, I love writing, recording, playing, releasing music, and expressing myself you know, via the songs that I write and the songs that I collaborate on, and, you know... Um, Part of it was sort of making up for lost time. Well, I'm hugely proud of the you know the records we made in Rage Against the Machine. Those records came out like once every four years, and so I had this like this very much pent up creativity. We made you know so with Audio Slave, Street Sweeper, Night Watchman, it's like um, the ability. I also have a home studio as well, so the ability to kind of just go and record and like I'm excited about making, writing, recording music, uh, whether it's folk music or whether it's blistering guitar solo music. Um, like I've always been very prolific and have got kind of a, a motor in me that doesn't really turn off and you know if you add to that the you know the the, the music for the the score for the orchid comic book uh, which is another i think we're seven or eight songs into that as that as well uh and there's a new night watching record sort of been brewing in my head uh, as well so i really love um that's what i'm in it for you know i i feel very blessed to be able to to do for a living the thing that i love the most which is to write record and perform music for you nice people so thank you very much. This has been The Night Watchman Speaks. You can see past issues of this and submit your own questions at nightwatchmanmusic.com. Uh, you can always go to axisofjustice.net to learn what's going on in the political world of Serge Tankian and myself. Uh, but thank you very much for your thoughtful submissions, and we'll see you next time on uh, The Night Watchman Speaks. Adios, people.